Thank you for taking the time to review the Truth Organization. Our mission is to utilize our financial earnings for multiple retail and service industry operations in our community, communities to fund and execute the economical, educational, political, and humanita humanitarian recovery of non-immigrants assigned the status of Black in America. The goal of this presentation is to briefly cover the state of Blacks in America, to analyze where we are, to discuss how we got here, and to give a plan of action on how to eradicate poverty in our communities. The path to our success will be understanding our current state of affairs, uh, coming up with an economic development plan, re-education for our adults, true education for our kids, develop a homegrown political power and representation, in our communities, and then a security system that would allow us to police the police. This flow chart shows our mission statement as mentioned in the first slide. It also shows you that we will have a for-profit organization as well as a not-for-profit organization, which would definitely benefit the community. And we will have short-term goals and long-term goals uh, to bring forth the for-profit organization and engagement strategies in implementing the not-for-profit organization. So the for-profit organization, how that will work is that the goal would be to design corporations that are built with the intent to maximize employment and not profits. Now we do want to maximize revenues so that the more revenues we generate, the more we can employ our people. And from employment, then also talk about maximizing wages and at some point reducing the work week for our uh, employees. Um, so how does that work, right? So people probably, that's the question that comes up is how do you do those things? So currently I run a grocery store that does about, uh, let's say average $500,000 a week in sales. Uh, so talking about two million, somewhere between, you know, 1.75 million a month to two million dollars a month in sales is what we do, and we employ currently about 135 employees. We make about 10% of that money um, in profit, and so if we do the math, we can see that with this one business unit, at, let's just take the low end, 1.75 million um, at 10% profit gives us $175,000 monthly uh, net income from that operation. Now, granted, there is a couple um, uh, accounting lines on that that actually increases this number, but for simplicity's sake, we're going to stick to this 10% net profit. So now that $175,000, instead of thinking like, man, that's great, we can just keep this money to the bank, imagine had we taken the approach that we would cap the profits of this company at uh, $50,000 a month. That $50,000 then can be um, further invested to build uh, other organizations, other businesses, and or donated some of that money to our not-for-profit organization. And so what do you do with the rest of that money then? Well, the first thing we would do is that we would increase employment. So if I can do a half a million a week and employ 140 people, then maybe I should increase my employment to about 200 to 225 people. Um, in addition to that, I can also increase their wages. And so the fuss that you hear currently is that the livable wage in America is about $15 an hour. Um, so that's about, that's a little over $30,000 a year. And we can easily achieve that with the quantity, uh, with the half a million dollars of revenue, a week, half a million dollar weekly revenues and $175,000 monthly profits. Um, so then as sales continue to grow, then profits will grow. And as profits grow, what we can do is at some point we're going to have too many employees in one building. So then what we will do is we'll stop hiring, but we would build alternative businesses, but consistently increase the wages of the employees. And so we can make the same 30 plus thousand dollars a year if we worked 32 hours and made $18 an hour. And so this will, this is how we will continue to adjust the mathematical equation that, um, 
to increase, maximize employment, maximize wages, and reduce the work week for our people. Um, and then at the end, we can still make more money. We can do that, you know, many, many different businesses fronts, right? We can go from um, our own beauty care store that houses a salon and a barbershop in the back. We can do this from a grocery store to a pharmacy, from a pharmacy to a dentist, doctor's office. Uh, we have many, many other avenues that we can utilize to be able to uh, uh, max to generate sales and revenues and provide services to our communities. Um, then we can utilize some of that money to then dump into a not-for-profit organization. So it's kind of like taking the money out of your left pocket, putting your right pocket. And then we can start our charitable organizations that are going to further help uh, empower the community. Because as we develop and we grow ourselves, we're going to need... Uh, a way to get the children through a proper education system. And so with the way that the world is designed today with the privatization of schools, we can utilize some of that not-for-profit money to actually build us a charter school. And then we can empower and teach and educate our children how we want to. Um, we can also then uh, raise and build our, our political leaders who then will go out and represent us um, in a political arena um, for our community. And then as we further grow, we can actually dominate and control our cities and eventually continue to move together and build, build, you know, further control things. So and, and in part, that not-for-profit thing can also generate income, uh, generate money and funds to be able to fund our, our uh, much-needed police department and eventually begin to move the people who understand and hold our same concerns at heart into police uh, positions that oversee our communities. It is not to police the people, though. It's to police the police. So to ensure that the, the current establishment, the, the policyholders or, or current day slave catchers uh, will know that they will not be able to come into our community and cause harm and think that we would simply just stand uh, aside and allow it. Um, it has always been a, a question in my mind is how did it feel um, as a slave uh, back in the, you know, in, in the known slave era? Um, to watch another slave beaten and and to be the masses in society in that arena you watching you know one slave master or a few of them when it's hundreds of us uh, being brutally beat and yet we stand in silence and then now today as I watch recording after recording I get a feel that the sense of hopelessness that the slaves held are still is still present today. So currently, the American uh, GDP, which is gross domestic project product, is about sixteen to seventeen trillion dollars annually. Of that money, blacks uh, contribute about one point one trillion dollars annually. Unfortunately, we only have about two percent of that that goes into a black-owned business. Um, and so that there is our single biggest challenge as blacks in America is to figure a way to uh, move that that 98 percent of our purchasing power uh, into the hands of ourselves and begin how every other culture have done and allow that money to circulate throughout communities. This is the fundamental largest challenge that we have to eradicating our problem in this country. Now, granted, I believe once we are able to do this, further problems will come because they will realize uh, how much money uh, we actually contribute to the comfort of their lives. And we can see throughout history the, uh, the times that we have accidentally um, began to ether aggregate our resources, uh, they came to burn us down. Philadelphia will be one of those examples where they bombed it, and then Black Wall Street. Now, note that these uh, these anomalies that took place throughout America for black folks where we built, you know, things like Black Wall Street had been done accidentally. And it happened because the white area that we lived on the outskirts of was so rich and wealthy. So like Tulsa, Oklahoma um, was doing the one of the biggest oil booms and they were so rich and wealthy that the, the labor that was needed to fund the wealth for the white folks spilled over into the black hands. But when the blacks got the money, they began to try to patronize the white businesses because we didn't have them and the white shut them out. So then led black folks to actually building their own businesses. 
And then once that happened, they realized how much wealth was actually being generated from blacks and black dollars. They got afraid and they burned them down. Um, and furthermore, if you look at the history of lynching, most lynchings that took place in America took place to black male business owners for the reason of continually to destroy our economic power. And let them tell you today that racism is these signs that hung over water fountains. Well, really, that didn't matter. Because truth be told, unless uh, the black water fountain was spitting out mud and the, and the white water fountain was spitting out clear water, they were tied to a T in the ground that pretty much was the same water, just came out two different spouts. So better understanding what racism is, is going to be huge in our movement moving forward to further empower ourselves. So as we continue on and further... Uh, review the state of affairs. We know currently that blacks make up about 13% of the American population. Uh, and believe it or not, that population for us is actually growing. And uh, the Caucasian population is decreasing. Uh, we have about $1.1 trillion of purchasing power. Of that $1.1 trillion, um, about $400 billion of that is disposable income. So the difference is uh, disposable income is the things that we spend on um, non-necessities, you know, um, the, the, the branding, clothing, shoes, the, uh, you know, barbershops and hair uh, activities. So we spent about $400 billion on that kind of stuff, random stuff that we don't need. And then the rest of that money is spent on the essentials, which is living, food, uh, you know, things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, currently, we have little to any control over our educational system, our food, our medication in our communities, uh, which leaves us very vulnerable because a sick person cannot revoke. So if we plague with diabetes, high blood pressure, um, because of the poor quality food that's in our community, um, then we can never effectively uh, lead a revolt to be able to take our lives back. Uh, our education system serves as a gateway to prison as it, as it doesn't provide us with the tools to build and sustain employment for ourselves. Uh, the available food serves as a gateway to disease and illnesses as it is of poor quality, poor ingredients, and have known carcinogens in many of the things that are served in our communities. Um, we don't have any rites of passage designed to guide us from childhood to adults. There's this imaginary switch that uh, black folks think that the minute that your child turns 18, you should be able to throw them out there in the world and they should be able to survive, um, regardless of how well you did or did not provide uh, or educate them on how to survive in this world. Uh, we have no power over the political policy as enacted upon us, um, even in the areas where we become the majority. So in cities like New Orleans, Detroit, um, they have they have put in um, these laws that, that viciously criminalize us. Um, and we're the majority. And the reason is because we lack the unity and we don't vote as one. Um, and we don't utilize that power in the vote and or the ability to to bring forth money to fund any candidacy that we think should, that would make uh, decisions in the best interest of us. Uh, we make up almost 51% of the prison population, and of that, most of those prisons are black men. So that's more more issues that we do have in our current state of affairs. So looking back a little bit though, when we talk about the, the school to jail pipeline situation, um, I have, I'm a firm believer that the human species is limited in its ability to solve its own problems based on its past experience and exposure in life. But if we look out amongst the world, we see education systems that actually work to provide a very thought-provoking human being. Um, however, um, what we've also found is that education systems in our country are designed to create employees for the area in which they occupy. What does that mean? That means that, say, for instance, New Orleans, which is a high tourist industry, don't need a bunch of scientists in that area. They don't need a bunch of doctors. They don't need, you know what I mean, things of that nature. What they need is more hotel uh, maids and uh, people to shuck oysters and things of that nature. So the education system is designed to, to, to create marginally educated black folks in the city of New Orleans uh, to be hard workers for white folks in that city. If you go to Silicon Valley, I ensure you that that system of education is far different than the system of education in New Orleans, but yet we're in the same country. So we have access to it. We just choose not to implement it into our daily, uh, in our daily lives for people everywhere across our country.
So this, my friend, is by far the most important and for me the most enjoyable part to explain. I love talking about how to actually make this happen. Of course, some of the things I have quoted we have heard before, but there wasn't an obtainable solution. If one was proposed, the solution requires some large number of people or one person or two with a large sum of money. What is exciting about this plan is it is doable. The plan of action is achievable with minimal financial input from fewer people to make it happen. So a short-term goal to give life to our for-profit organization, the Black Print Investment Group, is to recruit 100 people. Fortunately, if you receive this presentation, you are part of that initial 100 people I hope to recruit. Mm -hmm. Then we will establish an executive board with the CEO, CFO, CO, and the board of directors and all that other good stuff. With that initial 100 people, we will ask each person to purchase 10,000 shares of preferred stock um, in this newly formed corporation. The 10,000 shares will cost each investor $1,000, which is 10 cents per share. When we achieve this goal, we will give this will give us $100,000 of paid in capital for our first round of investments. The investment group will, will be solicited for ideas for business ventures. The board of directors will vote on the ideas submitted, and the executive board will make the final call. Next, we will move forward with establishing our first businesses. So let's talk a little bit about that, right? How does that work? So I would expect and hope that this initial group will have the ability to understand the limitations and expertise um, of what they what they do and can't do. So if you're listening to me now and uh, you may have the conceptual understanding of this presentation, still you may or may not have the skills, tools, expertise to make this come to fruition, but you still want to be a part of the movement. So what I would hope for you to do is that you will purchase your shares, hold on for your investments, vote when it's time to come to vote, uh, but have a limited input in the areas where you're not an expert or have not been involved in or are successful. On the other hand, if you are successful, um, involved in or experienced in certain matters, we would hope that you would apply it to the board members, apply for a board member position and offer your val valuable advice and suggestions. Your expertise will be welcomed and needed. Um, so a little bit further clarification is like, Currently, um, I've been employed in a retail manager for over 18 years. I've managed three different Fortune 500 companies. Um, so when we talk retail operations, I have a respectful amount of input. Uh, from another perspective, if we're talking accounting, my input would be very limited. Although I'm currently studying to be an accountant, I am not yet an expert. I am not fluent in the subject matter. So again, I understand my limitations. And in other words, um, it is important for each of us to know what we know and, and what we don't know. Um, so know your strengths and know your weaknesses. Um, that's enough of the personality stuff. Let's keep going. Um, so that would be the first round of small donate, small donate, not donations, small investments. Of course, this does mean that uh, you will get a return. You won't get a return on your investment the following year, or maybe not even the first two to five years. I'm reaching out to you because I think you have the interest of the people at heart more than the interest of yourself. So hopefully you are chosen wisely. And if you join the team, you will see the benefit of what we are doing for the masses of our people, one community at a time. The work will not be easy, but it will be rewarding, short and long term. It will be beneficial in the long run for the whole. So we will need to attract people from all fields of professions, from MBAs, CPAs, doctors, nurses, lawyers, pharmacies, and many other disciplines, as well as tradesmen and laborers. So as we talked about initially with the uh, first round of investments, our goal will be secondly to seek out another um, another round of investors. And how we, how I propose that happen is that uh, for the 100 of us who the 100 initial investors uh, will seek to sell 5,000 shares of common stock um, per 10,000 shares of preferred stock that you own. And so what does that mean? So if I purchase just one batch of, of preferred stock, 1000 if I invested the first $1,000, then I will look to sell 5,000 additional shares outside of mine. I um, mean, you're just, you're just seeking for investors. That can be done as easily uh, if you know uh, 50 people who want to invest $2 a share. Uh, it costs them 200 bucks, um, uh, and they'll get 100 shares of the common stock. Uh, this second wave of of, of, of um, 
fundraising will give us a an, million dollars in, in additional paid in capital to further fund businesses and operations. Um, so the ultimate goal, I think, which would be the biggest, uh, give us the biggest bang for our buck, um, will be uh, in this Life Center idea. And if you have this slide and you can click on a link, a Life Center, and it'll give you more detail of what it is. But other business ideas is uh, build beauty supply stores that have uh, that have a hair salon and barbershop in it. We can build some restaurants. Um, but the Life Center, I think, is once we get into this wave of investments, would be the uh, the thing that we can do that allow us the biggest bang for our buck in terms of investments. So now let's get a little bit into the not-for-profit organization. It is pertinent to note that the formation of this is not for profit organization must be funded 100% by the businesses and communities in which it serves. If the community is to allow for anyone other than those it is designed to serve to fund it, they will surely destroy its primary agenda of creating a path to enable the people to care for themselves. This is evident as the NAACP is not owned and controlled by Negroes or Blacks or African Americans or however you want to identify us. Um, it is controlled by some wealthy white folks. And as a result, um, it has done more for minorities, um, non-Black minorities, than it has for Blacks. Uh, so our organization needs to be completely funded by us so that we may uh, utilize the donations from our business entities to fully engage in the not-for-profit works of building community, education systems, uh, police systems to police to police, and other uh, pertinent rights of passage programs to further empower, educate, motivate, uplift, and eradicate our situations in our community. So much like the for-profit organization, not-for-profit organizations are also uh, corporations that we, we would still have to establish a board, appoint CEO, CFOs, and things of that nature. Um, we would utilize some of that funds to do things like creating free after-school programs um, that would nourish the community with meals and begin the re-education process, um, history lessons, how to grow food, math and science, etc. right? Uh, we would design weekend rites of passage processes programs that would allow um, that would also deliver financial literacy classes on the weekend to empower our youth to be able to actually turn 18, 19 and survive and understand how money works. Um, free self-defense training and identify our warrior classes. And in doing that, we'll be able to provide our, our we'll be able to provide our community with the much needed police force to police the police. Um, of course, over the summer, we'll be able to increase these activities um with uh increased sales and profits from our other for-profit organizations uh but this is just a, a, a ballpark start idea of what it is we want to do and can do with the not-for-profit uh, entity and of course all of us who own have ownership share in the for-profit side will have a, a voting power and some input on what they would like to see happen in the not-for-profit organizations So in closing, um, you have my name, my email, my contact information. Uh, but uh, overall, um, the goal is to begin to ether aggregate our financial resources, gain control, build businesses, build communities, build education systems, empower and free ourselves. And hopefully as we continue to do this, we can reach back uh, and, and touch bases with uh, with uh, other organizations uh, throughout the country as we build the first blueprint, but also reach back to Africa and uh, make alliances there as we can take these ideas and, and, and expand them everywhere where the current style of capitalist system exists. Um, again, thank you for taking your time and going through this, listening to what I have to say, and I hope to see you on the investment side as we begin the works to free our people.